Gentlemen, uh, thank you for inviting me to discuss this uh, very uh, good paper. Uh, I really enjoy reading your paper, Oscar. No? And this paper again provides us a warning call again and again to not fall to the same hole. If this time is different, probably not. We have experienced this ones in the past. So there's nothing new for us. We know these ones. We experienced in the past, in 1973 as well as in 1983. Everything has its time. I mean, of course, the quadratic mentioned about 8.8 8 years plus several months, the cycle. And again, the Prince of Egypt, you remember the Prince of Egypt, he mentioned about seven years of plenty and seven years of plenty. And uh, we start from what we have learned from the past. In 1973 and 83, of course, we experienced these ones, and mostly we are dependent on oil at the time. And the fundamental, of course, is not much different. And the demand pool is very significant at the time for energy. This is why the price of oil is increasing rapidly, especially coming from the advanced countries. And China is not yet there, and similarly for other emerging markets. And of course, we have a political shock in the Middle East. And Carta, OPEC, and we are in the members of OPEC in, in, in that time, and of course now it's not anything. Then from 2003 to 2011, this is the commodities boom. We have a more various uh, commodities. It's not only oil. Even oil is already disappeared because we are not a member of OPEC since you know, mid 2005, probably. And um, the demand is mostly coming from China. Yeah, now it's, a, it's a new. And uh, at the same time, in 2000. Seven or eight, as you remember, that is a quantitative easing, the liquidity boom, and also the, the low interest rate environment somehow playing in the market. This is why the price of commodities also increasing quite significantly in 2008 and 2009. But this is a tailwind, as 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 Pat Ross mentioned about the tailwind, and now after 2011 we have headwind. It's just the opposite of these ones. The opposite is basically China now is slowing down, and at the same time, we already see a normalization of the quantitative easing. We see probably the normalizations of the liquidity and the low interest rate eventually will disappear in the near term. It's a matter of time. Now, uh, we understand this problem. We always have a big challenge when we face this commodity boom. And, and any country that experiences boom, at the end probably will probably have experienced boost as well. It's always a challenge is how to manage the impact of volatile commodity prices on macroeconomics and financial stability. And how to increase, number two, is how to increase the competitiveness. Basically, the sustainability of our growth during the commodity boom. And number three is how to ensure that natural resource wealth is wisely used and shared fairly across society and also across regions. Of course, Pa. Uh, Iwan mentioned about the Duchesses. I still remember in 1970s and 1980s. There are many uh, research papers, there are many dissertations paper, dissertations that uh, make the Dutch disease as a, as a, as a, as a, as a main uh, research at the time. A friend of mine also do some uh, paper on this one and even make his dissertation based on the Dutch disease. So again, 
we know peace was. We are familiar with this boom and cycle. And yet, probably, we haven't learned yet. Three identified problem whether this is different with the past. I think it's not much different, as Ross mentions in his paper. He continued to revert to what we experienced in the past. A loss of competitiveness is potentially uh, dynamic. And of course, non-natural resources, especially manufacturing sectors, as Patros mentioned in terms of terms of trade and then because of the real exchange rate also, that bias against non-natural resource. And even more important, as we see the numbers in the presentations, in the papers, <coughs> We see even the industrializations when we face a commodity boom, both in terms of growth and also in terms of jobs creations. And at the same time, as many countries that experience this boom, Indonesia also becomes focusing on the narrow-based production. And we are become excessive reliance on commodities revenue, both in terms of balance of payment and also in terms of government revenue. As uh, Bai Iwan put it in the in the in the in the a graph in the morning, you see a significant increase in non in, in natural resources or in agriculture and also resources export compared to manufacturing. The manufacturing share on export is declined sharply. In terms of revenue, if you look at our revenue over the last seven, eight years. The, 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 the increase of our revenue mostly from non-tax revenue and it's from royalties and if you look at further, even from top tax revenue, it is mostly again from the commodity sector. So both in terms of balance of payment and also in terms of budget, government budget, we become dependent on these commodities. And at the same time, if the price of commodities fluctuated high or even declined, then we see also a fluctuations and become vulnerable to our financial stability as well. So both macro economics and also financial stability also affected. It is reflected in our rupiah. If you look at rupiah recently, it is somehow also because of the volatility in the commodity price that affected our financial market as well. And the last problem here that we identify is a rent-seeking behavior which can undermine the governance and even exacerbate the difficulties of building robust and growth enabling institutions. In the past, we have a problem with Portamina in the 1970s. And now, as pa Ross mentioned in the paper, which is he, he, he did not discuss quite extensively, is that a political party sponsorship come from this uh, uh, commodities, basically. Now, and that happened. So this is a big problem that Indonesia are facing. Now let's see some numbers here. If you just look at the performance of Indonesia after this is after uh, 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 the crisis, after the the boom in 1973 and also 1983. So this is so-called the manufacturing-led growth compared to the commodities-led growth 2004 to 2011. Look at all the numbers. 
clearly from this number, from this picture, say that the GDP growth during the manufacturer led growth is higher or much better than the commodities led growth. And look at here the industry. Industry itself, which is comprised with the manufacturer, again you have also mining there, part of the mining, and also elect electricity, gas, gas, I, I think is part of the, 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 the industry. But specifically look at the manufacturer. Manufacturer grew by 12.82, 12.8% during the manufacturer led growth in 1983 and 1996. Comparing to the only 4.62, 2004 to 2011. And of course, again, all this number, the GDP per capita increasing is better compared to the commodities that grow. And almost all the numbers is better. Now, this is the picture, the same like uh, Ivan already mentioned in the morning. I don't go to this to, to, to this one, but let me see here again uh, what Pat Sadly mentions. We need pain to push reform, probably. I don't know whether the pain that we experience now is is not yet strong enough, or we need more pain to push reform. I don't know exactly, but this has happened in 1983 to 19. 90s basically. We do make reform significantly. We have a trade reform, yeah. we also have a, a, a revenue reform, a tax reform. Yeah. This is a series of reform. We enact a tax law in 1984 to increase the non-oil tax revenue because again in 1973 and 2000, uh, up to 1983, we are become dependent on oil. Almost 60% of our revenue coming from this uh, area, from, from, from oil revenue. And then we reformed it in 1984. So all reform is basically uh, introduced after, after we are suffering, uh, after this uh, post-oil boom. So we have uh, investments. We encourage FDI, we support trade reform, yeah. even we uh, also have a banking deregulations after we experienced the post-oil boom, after the, the, the boost in 1983 especially. The question is basically, are the recipe from what we have right now is still the same or not? Is this time is different? Probably almost all the pillars of this reform is quite similar with what we need. This is what we need is basically now. But the problem now is basically we think that we still rich. That's the problem. Yeah, even if you hear today, even yesterday in the newspaper, the leader of the country still mentioned we are still rich. We are among the rich. I mean, as an economist, if you feel rich, if you feel, I mean, it's just like you maximize something with no constraint. It's basically, as an economist, we know everything is limited. So we need to maximize something, to optimize something, subject to constraint. The problem is basically, we have a limited resources. That's, in my view, the basic <coughs> idea that we need to realize. And this country, I think now, a vast majority of the people of Indonesia still believe as if we are very rich. We have unlimited resources. And similarly, also, even among <coughs> the government officials, still thinking the same thing. So, based on these ones, the basic Policy guidance and response is not much different. Basically, we need to manage the extractions of our commodities. It's much more effective on a competitive basis. And we need to depoliticize 
the resource contract. Yes. We try to, dis to distance when we decide this contract is not based on the political closeness or political support. This is remain, I think, one of the main constraints that we will face. It's not only this year, probably over the next 10 years or 15 years. And somehow related to the uh, political reform in Indonesia. And at the same time, of course, fiscal policy is very important. We know we have our, our limited resources, and we need to use it effectively. Again, subsidy cut is one of the one of the, the, the a good policy. And the second policy, of course, to reallocate this uh, cut, this saving to a more productive sector, namely infrastructures, improving the human capital and skill. And it is very important as well to have a medium term spending uh, plan. This is one of the problems that we face today in Indonesia. As you know, our budget is really not credible because we think that we can increase revenue in one year. And, and this is create a problem. We need to have a medium term spending and also revenue plan. At the same time, I mean, I'm, I'm in favor of a, a Chilean uh, stabilization fund somehow in the future. We need to have uh, a fund that we can have a, a kind of a counter cyclical when we face a uh, boost, when we face uh, a decline, a significant, a significant decline of the economy. And monetary and financial stability. This is again, if you look at from uh, real effective exchange rate, right now the focus in the nominal exchange rate. This is a mistake. And then Ross mentioned about this. Basically, our real effective exchange rate still is too strong. So if you look at from this perspective, basically the rupiah need to depreciate. I mean, in the past, as we know, during the Suharto era, Indonesia continued to depreciate, and the government take lead on this one by the amount of the difference between inflation in Indonesia and inflation in the U.S. This is why we have 4% to 5% depreciations at the time in order to increase the productivity in order to increase the competitiveness of Indonesia. But at the same time, of course, we need to improve the competitiveness. We need to increase the competitiveness by uh, uh, structural reform yeah. to boost competitiveness and uh, productivity. Um, I'm more, I still have uh, hope that Indonesia can uh, exit from this problem. But again, of course, first thing first, we have to admit that our limited resources, we are not that rich. Yeah. We have to use it efficiently. At the same time, the technology out there <coughs> developed very rapidly. And Indonesia is far away from the uh, production possibility frontier. So Indonesia is not probably the most important one for us is not to be innovators, <laughs> to be ahead in the production possibility frontier. We are far away, but we are more focused on to increase the capacity of our worker, to increase our capacity to adapt, to use the technology that available in the market right now. But if you want to do that, first thing first, we have to admit the problem. We have to admit that we are not the same anymore. And we have to avoid fall at the same hole again. With this, I think uh, I would like to congratulate uh, Ross 
this is a very interesting paper and remind us again that Indonesia will face again a cycle. We may face an up cycle again, a boom in the future, because it's a cycle, but we know after the boom, it might be a boost that we have to be ready for this. Thank you very much.